Thank you. The next item of business is a debate on motion 17265 in the name of Eileen Campbell on adopting a place principle. Can I invite those members who wish to speak in the debate to press the request to speak buttons now? And I call on Eileen Campbell to speak to move the motion. Cabinet Secretary, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open this debate on the place principle because fundamentally it's an approach that seeks to ensure that we as policymakers make and take better decisions and ensure these decisions have people and community at heart and deliver positive outcomes. It's an approach that explicitly recognises the importance of place in shaping opportunity for people and providing a sense of connectedness and belonging. The principle understands that the places where we live and grow up in shape our lives and influence our life chances. So, presiding officer, there's probably very little to disagree with, but like so many other areas of public and social policy, while it sounds positive and commands respect and support, it presents challenge and it contest. Because the place principle also seeks to help overcome policy silos and organisational boundaries and encourage better collaboration, resource utilisation and community participation to improve outcomes and tackle inequalities. And sometimes knocking down silos and disregarding boundaries is difficult. But in the pursuit of better decisions, better outcomes and collaboration, and to do so centred around place, is a prize worth working hard for. And presiding officer, place-based approaches or community empowerment are not new concepts, but what we have with this approach and with the agreement and support of our colleagues in COSLA is an opportunity to ensure we can put people in place at the heart of better decision-making, enabling more places in Scotland to flourish. The place principle asks that, as, that all partners responsible for providing services and looking after assets in a place work and plan together to support inclusive and sustainable economic growth and create more successful places. Crucially, it recognises that local decision making and delivery informed by the people who live and work there are key to the social, economic and physical success of places. And we agreed the place principle with COSLA and our joint focus now is on implementing the principle to create the impetus for ambitious and effective place-based approaches right across the country. Because we want to see a Scotland in which everyone can play a full part in society with empowered communities, be that town, village, city, rural, island or urban, able to shape their individual and collective futures wherever they are across the country and whatever size or scale. And all of us in this chamber can add to the collective leadership required to make the place principle a reality because we all have a role to play in improving outcomes and addressing inequalities and supporting local economies in and across our communities. Yes. Neil Finlay. Minister for taking intervention. Um, back in the real world, what's happening in communities is that they are experiencing cuts to youth work, cuts to environmental services, the roads are in a poorer condition, the places more heavily littered, fly tippings on the increase. So all of this theoretical debate about placemaking, very interesting though it is, will the Minister reflect the reality out there in the real world? Cabinet Secretary. Well, back in the real world for Neil uh, Finlay, uh, we have the, the collaboration and cooperation of COSLA of a whole host of different partners who want to make this uh, a reality. And also not forgetting, but most importantly, communities themselves we're actually playing yeah. catch up with communities who want us as decision makers to make decisions, take better decisions based on place. And I'll just remind uh, Mr Finlay as well that the budget and resource that this government has given to local authorities has increased and it's a fair settlement as well. This is about making sure that we use that resource wisely yeah. and effectively. And that in the real world is what people out there and expect of their politicians to be doing. So implementing the place principle is about asking questions across all spatial or geographical scales. And what is this place for and how do people use it? And as we seek the answers, we need to commit to engaging with and involving local, local people and communities in determining where and how we invest those finite resources and make the most of our combined assets. People and communities are often challenged by multiple disadvantage, and that means that addressing a singular issue whilst welcome will never resolve those deep-rooted issues which are often interlinked and permeate many facets of people's lives. The PLACE principle gives a common focus and the potential to collectively develop preventative, sustainable solutions which enable us to tackle complex, multiple inequalities and disadvantages in a particularly effective and targeted way. And adopting and scaling up this approach will enable us to make good on the challenges set to us by Campbell Christie. He noted that in order to deliver good public services with positive outcomes for people and communities, that we must reform how we work, empower when we can, maximise the impact of the resource and be strategic in how we achieve our goal of reducing inequalities. 
And that means working with our communities in partnership, building on their assets and not doing things to them. Because as we all know, when people feel they can influence what happens in their communities and can contribute to delivering change, communities are energised and achieve huge benefits. And this requires the discipline of a more joined up, collaborative and integrated approach to services, land and buildings, improving cross-government working, improving collaboration between communities in the public, private and third sectors, and the efficient and effective utilisation of our collective energy and resources to meet the most of their impact. The PLACE principle supports the effective and efficient use of, and, of our collective resource by redirecting available investments and resources to where they can make a positive difference and that extends to how partners collaborate and participate with the local community. The PLACE principle can spark activity and action across different sectors, transport, health, private and third sector and across types of actors and unusual partners. The challenge going forward will be in the quality of our collaboration in planning decisions and investments. And there are opportunities ahead that if we grasp in the right way can ramp this up and get on and deliver the place principles and the challenges laid down by Christie. Driving our work across government, local government and beyond are the national outcomes set out within Scotland's national performance framework. And it's important because it articulates a shared vision for the type of Scotland that we all want to work towards and measure success against more than just a growing economy or GDP, but instead measure success by ensuring well-being, thriving communities and happiness. And before I take Mr Rowley, just to say to members, there is time for interventions. You will get your time back. Mr Rowley. I don't know if the Cabinet Secretary is trying to rewrite the Christie report, because one of the key messages in the Christie report was preventative spend, and that uh, we needed to start to see more preventative spend, but she's not really mentioned that and, and what she's saying. Cabinet Secretary. I did say preventative, uh, prevent, uh, prevention uh, in, in my remarks, but I certainly would not be seeking to rewrite Christie. I absolutely, totally subscribe to the principles of Christie. And I think this approach fits well with that and will enable us to make good on the challenge that he set out to us. But he also set out that we need to reform public services, that we need to make sure that we maximise the resources that we have eh, to improve outcomes for our communities and also to empower our communities as well. And this place approach, it enables us to do all of those things. And in the framework and of the, however, of the national performance framework and the outcomes that we need to work towards, including its focus on place, provides a chance to make good on the vision that's set out within the NPF. And it sets out the direction and it permits innovation and imagination. And the place principle can act as an enabler eh, of the national performance framework locally to make it applicable to where and how people and communities live and work. It seeks to drive forward an economy that works for everyone, providing opportunities to all, creating sustainable and inclusive growth so that no one's left behind and recognises the potential and the assets that exist. And the importance of building on the assets of all our places and communities to drive inclusive growth can be seen in our support for our city, region and growth deals. So far, we've committed around £1.7 billion to those transformational investment programmes across Scotland, aimed at delivering real benefits for communities in the form of jobs and other economic opportunities. And it's important that our public services are responsive to the circumstances experienced by different places across the country. And it's equally important that those working to assist businesses to create and protect jobs are focused on the asset base and economic potential of our varied local places and distinctive regions. New multi-partner regional uh, partnerships inspired by the growth deal experiences are all looking to identify long-term opportunities in key areas of growth, as well as tackling shared challenges across their regions, such as child poverty. And as this work progresses, the need for the place principle becomes ever stronger as a way to blend our economic ambitions with our social justice ones. We cannot, on one hand, talk about tackling in-work poverty if we don't seek, for instance, to ensure that these catalytic uh, deals and regional partnerships enable people to access jobs with decent pay. And the place principle is about tailoring approaches to the needs and opportunities of different areas. And that's why recognising the different economic challenges being faced by the South of Scotland, we're establishing a, the South of Scotland enterprise. And that new agency will be operational next year, will embed place-based support for businesses and communities at the centre of that approach. And when the First Minister launched our programme for government last September, we also embarked on a programme of work to develop a vision for how our homes and communities should look and feel in 2040 and the options and choices to get there. Since then, we've engaged with a wide range of housing interests on a number of themes, one of which was place. And it's clear that from that engagement, the placemaking approaches are supported strongly by a wide range of individuals and organisations. And it will be important for government and stakeholders to consider the essence of the principle as we develop our vision for housing to 2040 and the milestones to get there. 
but we also need to make this approach real and tangible. Fort William is on the cusp of a scale of investment that is potentially transformative for residents and visitors. Building the vision for Fort William around the place principle presents a great opportunity to illustrate how aligning national and local investment coupled with the wider public sector leadership on place, along with the support of the local community interests, can stimulate positive place-based outcomes for this community and the wider area. Approximately 20 key projects have been identified to be implemented in the next five to 10 year period, transport improvements, a new hospital, STEM facility, port, port expansion, and other cultural, commercial, and tourist related investments. But there are many other examples across the country which exemplify the current uh, inherent practices of the place principle. This Children's Neighbourhood Scotland, which brings together people, resources and organisations to work together to improve the lives of children and young people. And we are supporting that work through the Tackling Child Poverty Fund. It builds on the learning from similar international in initiatives in the Netherlands and in the US. And recently, the Grant and Partnership uh, agreed to adopt the place principle to help them test how they collectively combine resources and work with the local community plan to make decisions and investments to revitalise the local economy and community. Our focus now and going forward needs to be on learning from what works and using practical examples to illustrate how the place principle can be adopted across the country. And MSPs are uniquely positioned to support local partners and communities to take advantage of the opportunities that this approach brings. The approach represents the sensible uh, marshalling of resources to maximise their impact instead of doing a road here or a housing there and then working out how to ensure that folk will benefit from that. So, presiding officer, as parliamentarians, we are each privileged to represent constituencies and regions across Scotland. We know the unique, diverse uh, communities that we serve and we know the challenges that are facing Scotland, demographic, fiscal and environmental. We also know that there are too many who suffer inequality made worse by politically motivated austerity. Making and taking social economic decisions through the lens of place and guided by the principle of getting alongside our communities will enable better decisions, empower communities and more impactful use of resources. And it's an approach that our constituents demand that we take and can enable us to make more progress on the ambitions of Christie and the vision that we've set out in our national performance framework. But it is an approach that we will need to scale up and I'm looking forward to the views and opinions and the contributions of colleagues so that we can, I think, all work together to make the place principle the way that we do business here in Scotland. And I move the motion in my name. Thank you. Just about to remind you to do that. And I now call Alec Rowley to speak to and move Amendment 17265.2. Eight minutes or thereabouts, Mr Rowley. Presiding officer, this morning I read the weekly brief from Unison Scotland, my own trade union, and I noted that on this debate today they said the following. They said the place principle states a more joined up, collaborative and participative approach to services, land and buildings across all sectors within a place enables better outcomes for everyone and increases opportunities for people and communities to shape their own lives. They went on to say these are fine words, very fine words. Indeed, all they lack are words in favour of the delights of motherhood and apple pie. So in other words, what is there not to like about the place principle? But Unison then make the point, they say principles and budgets are, however, different things. It is in the detail of the latter that the seriousness of the former is to be judged. An examination of the public realm in Scotland would surely be the starting point. That the efficiencies and improvements of recent years have seen so many towns and villages lose police stations, libraries and public toilets, as well as other reductions in public services, might suggest that fine words are being preached here, but not practised. So that's the view of Scotland's largest public service trade union and is in line with our amendment. I say to the government and to all MSPs, if you fail to recognise the impact of austerity on local services and on local communities, then you're walking around with blinkers on when it comes to these issues. For example, last week I was contacted by a lady from Loch Ely who has mobility problems and uses a mobility scooter. She said that the good weather's coming in, but that the state of some of the pavements makes it very difficult for her to get around on her mobility scooter. 
So this, in my view, demonstrates that well-being, quality of life, physical and mental health, social and cultural life, and sustainability are influenced by the quality and design of the places we, li we live in. So the lady from Loch Ely is entitled to all these things. But moving from the rhetoric to the reality, the state of the pavements and the need for action is being halted by the cuts to council budgets. The council is struggling to fill the potholes, never mind fix the pavements. So let us not live in a bubble in this place. The reality is that in every community across Scotland, these issues exist and we cannot gloss over the impacts of austerity. And neither should we, for austerity... Yeah. Stuart McMillan. I thank uh, Alex Rowley for taking a brief intervention. Is Mr Rowley suggesting that potholes uh, in our society are something that's only happened uh, under austerity? Alec Rowley. Well, what I'm saying is that you only need to look at the evidence of the cuts to council budgets over this last decade to see the impact that that's having and therefore the major barrier to some of the nice, kind words that's come from the Cabinet Secretary. Uh, let, us, let us not live... Yeah. Cabinet Secretary. This debate is about trying to make better use of the resources that we have, to make good on the Christie principles, to make good on the notion of prevention to ensure that we can make better use of public funds. But in a whole host of ways, the Labour Party have always failed to come up with something that's credible to help us uh, and to contribute to the marshalling of those resources. They were absent in the, bu in the budget de debate, uh, granted you as an exception, but we've treated local government fairly and we're seeking to work with them on this agenda to ensure that we can take decisions around the places to ensure that people can feel that sense of well-being that I think we all probably agree with. But does he not accept, though, that Labour needs to be able to come forward with positive ideas about how we do uh, tackle some of these vicious issues that he's described? And before you respond, remember not to use the term you, but to speak through the chair, please, Cabinet Secretary Alec Rowley. Presiding officer, if you look at the manifesto for the many, not the, the few, you would see a plan for 70 odd billion pounds of investment coming into Scotland over the next decade. And that's, that's the kind of investment that we need to create. I'm happy to work with other parties. I know that the party opposite actually support austerity, but I'm happy to work with parties to look for investment. But that's the kind of level of ambition that we need for Scotland. The kind of ambition that John McDonnell, as Shadow Chancellor, is putting forward in the manifesto for the many, not the few. See, so let us not live in a bubble in this place. The reality is that in every community across Scotland, these issues exist. The potholes, the pavements, the cuts to local services exist and we cannot gloss over the impacts of austerity and neither should we for austerity is not an economic choice, it is a political choice. A political choice supported by politicians in this place. As the late Martin McGuinness said, austerity is devastating communities. The working poor public sector workers, the disabled and the vulnerable are the hardest hit by this bankrupt and ideologically driven policy. So the place principle is a useful framework that recognises that communities must be central to decision making and the most sustainable and beneficial outcomes are achieved when policy and practice integrate health, housing, environment, transport, community and spatial planning. But let us not use such frameworks to mask what is really going on. And otherwise, the people will not be the only people that we will be fooling will be ourselves, not the communities we represent. Well, now a year old, the Jimmy Reid Foundation and Unison Report on Local Government is more relevant than ever. It states that changes such as cutting library and leisure centre opening hours may on the face of it seem incremental change. However, these changes can prevent some individuals in communities accessing valuable services. Poorer households are more reliant on a range of public services, so feel the cumulative impact of multiple small cuts. 
for those on low incomes, especially those small changes, may have a sizeable impact and present significant and outright barriers accessing services. Labour's analysis published in December found that there had been £22 million of a reduction in spending for libraries over the past six years. A total of 69 libraries have closed across Scotland since 2011, according to official figures. This includes 30 in 2017, up 15 from the year before. The impact on cultural services has been far-reaching, with more than a £5 million cut from museums and galleries. Almost £20 million has been cut from the budget for sports facilities, while more than £30 million has been cut from community parks and open spaces. I know that in Fife, many really good projects that were built around the principle of social prescribing have disappeared as the funding has dried up. The place principle will never translate into meaningful community participation if people see not only the services they rely on being cut, but also the services that enrich their lives and make them feel part of the community being cut. A recent survey by Unison found that council workers identified a lack of frontline staff as one of the biggest challenges facing Scottish local authorities. More than two-thirds of those questions said that local residents did not receive the help and support they needed when they needed it, and 51% were not confident that vulnerable people are safe and cared for. During the passage of the planning bill, RTPI Scotland have stated that between 2009 and 2016, local authorities on average lost 23% of planning staff, while over the same period, planning service budgets were cut by an average of 32%. Now, I accept, presiding officer, that people genuinely want to use place to make the changes that's necessary. But I do say to MSPs in here today, if you don't recognise the impact of failed Tory austerity on our communities in Scotland, then you won't wake up to what needs to happen and the levels of investment that need to go into Scotland in order to achieve the ambitions that the Cabinet Secretary sets out. And please move your amendment, Mr Rowley. And I move my amendment, President Thank officer. you. And I'll call Michelle Ballantyne. Ms. Ballantyne, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. When I was appointed to the Planning Committee as a local councillor in 2012, I was given a book entitled Placemaking and Design. This, I was informed, was the good policy that would help guide my decision making. Often, as a Planning Committee member, the phrase beauty is in the eye of the beholder came to mind. But I certainly learnt to look at things differently, supported by some of that book and the wider information I was given, but also by some sage advice from Robert Maguire, one of our 20th century leading architects, who after retiring settled in the Scottish borders. Over good food and wine, Bob talked to me about how detail and beauty in architecture does not need to be lost in creating practical, cost-effective spaces. Bob is famous for the churches and student accommodation he designed, designs whose very nature was about inspiring and bringing together communities. Human beings have always seen design as important, he would tell me. For centuries, architects claimed that their designs would reshape society through the power of their art, which is a lovely, if unsubstantiated, notion. In the 1400s, Italian Renaissance-era architect Leon Bassetti Alberti claimed that balanced classical forms were so influential that they would compel aggressive invaders to down their arms and become civilians. US architect Frank Lloyd Wright believed that when done right, architecture would save the US from corruption and turn people back to wholesome endeavors. Whilst the Swiss-born French architect Le, Corbier Le Corbiesi claimed that the power of his design for his Villa Savoy would actually heal the sick, a claim that was so inaccurate that he only avoided court due to the commencement of World War II. However, what we do know is that boring buildings and large grey landscapes have been found to cause higher levels of stress. And without variety and stimulation, the human mind gets confused and is reminded just how far out of its natural habitat it is. So while there is no definitive answer as to how architecture can impact society, 
it is still widely understood and accepted that architecture will always serve more than simply a functional purpose. Presiding officer, the broad strokes of the place principle have a good pedigree and point to a considered and locally empowering approach to planning and public services. However, there are some aspects of the Scottish Government's interpretation of the place principle that I would appreciate some clarification on as to how the approach will work in practice. The Scottish Government has defined place as where people, location and resources combine to create a sense of identity and purpose. Places can be streets, villages, cities, regions and even the country as a whole. I have questions about how well this definition will hold when placed under the weight of reality. When scarce public resources are being distributed, planning will involve different places at different levels. It will, it will involve streets, parts of towns, or the town as a whole. And if the principle is going to be of practical worth, it has to outline how different places will interact when it comes to the planning and, and distribution of resources. The principle will have to determine how the needs and desires of some streets are weighed, weighed against the needs and desires of others, and how the, these interact with the needs and desires of the town as a whole. The Scottish Government states that the place principle will not be prescriptive and should be viewed more as an approach to planning and resource distribution than a set of rules to be followed to the letter. The Improvement Service has already created a checklist for councils to consult for place-based working, and I hope this checklist will not become in time a rubric for councils to be adopted as an official part of planning policy. And I'm going to be very quick in summary, <laughs> Deputy Presiding Officer. I am supportive of decision-making being taken at a local level, and I am an ardent believer in the idea that communities themselves know what is in their best interests. In many ways, this makes me a supporter of the theory behind the place principle, and I hope we can see more clarity on how the principle will help councils to distribute resources when places have opposing or contradictory desires and needs. Linked to this, I would like to know how the principle will support the representation of different places when council decisions are being made. I would like to avoid over-reliance on the new place standard tool and instead see a face-to-face -face and holistic approach to place representation that is in keeping with the values of localism and subsidiarity. I also hope the minister will outline how the application of place principle by councils will be monitored because I do believe that without some form of monitoring, it will be all too easy for the reasonable principles of local representation and a joined up approach to planning to be neglected. Presiding officer, I am in favour of many of the values that underpin the place principle, but I want to ensure that the Scottish Government can put theory into practice and deliver a strong policy that empowers communities to be able to choose what is right for them. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms Valentine. I now call on Andy Whiteman. Mr Whiteman, please. Thanks very much. Uh, presiding officer, and thanks to the uh, Scottish Government for bringing this topic to debate um, this afternoon. Uh, Greens are happy to support this motion and are supportive of the place principle, although uh, we don't support the assumptions underpinning the proposed outcome of inclusive and sustainable growth, but we'll leave that uh, to one side uh, for the moment. However, we are uh, rather sceptical uh, of the vague nature of the agreement struck between the Scottish Government and COSLA, which Whilst no doubt worthy, uh, it merely appears to request that these bodies responsible for delivering services and managing assets work together to enable enhanced outcomes, which is uh, um, uh, a proposition I thought had been agreed years and years ago. Now, the motion talks about local decision-making, but there's very little possibility of that uh, in our view when there is no real local government in Scotland compared to other countries like Finland, for example, with a similar population to Scotland, where there are over 330 municipalities with real power for communities to shape the place they live in, including substantial fiscal powers to raise the finance to pay for the things that the community uh, wishes to do. And so as the Macintosh Commission noted way back in 1999, uh, I quote, it could be said that Scotland sim today simply does not have a system of local government in the sense in which many other countries do. The 32 councils now existing are in effect what in other countries are called county councils or provinces. And as COSLA itself observed as well in 2013, Scotland's one of the most centralised countries in Europe. It's no coincidence that our European neighbours are often more successful at improving outcomes and have much greater turnout uh, at elections. Now, I concede that in recent years that we have seen a policy shift in community engagement across Scotland, thanks, yes, to the Community Empowerment Scotland Act uh, 2015, and, of course, to the Christie Commission on the Future 
delivery of public services uh, that preceded that. But as Alec Rowley pointed out, um, it talked about preventative spend, and I think there's a lot of work still to be done on the financing and accounting uh, for preventative spend, because I've seen many projects uh, in my own region uh, that have uh, 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 not secured uh, ongoing funding, despite having proven um, that they have managed to save other agencies substantial sums uh, of uh, money. And so I see no real prospect uh, of this so-called place principle having the kind of impact I think that might be envisaged uh, by the motion, because in my view what we need is a completely new approach to local governance, and we do await with interest the outcome of the Minister's deliberations uh, on this topic, but tentative steps like uh, participatory budgeting and, and local place plans, uh, whilst uh, welcome, are timid in comparison to the kind of powers that exist at a local level in any normal European country, which is why, for example, we need to return control of local taxation to local councils to reverse the centralisation undertaken by the UK Tory government over non-domestic rates and the SNP governments uh, over uh, council tax. And planning has already been mentioned. Uh, the Parliament's been scrutinising this bill and we'll return to it next month, uh, I gather. And MSPs from all parties have been tabling amendments, all designed to better improve the places in which we uh, live uh, and work. And what's evident is that, indeed, MSPs from all parties appear to agree that we need to strengthen the powers and responsibilities uh, of local uh, communities. But it remains the case that the planning system still appears to be massively dominated by powerful private interests. And genuine public-led development and planning is as remote a prospect as it has been uh, for many uh, decades. Presiding officer, the Greens were elected to this parliament on a manifesto to revitalise uh, local democracy. Now, by adopting the place principle, we are moving in the right direction, but we need to be critical. Uh, happy to do so, although I have... Yes, I've got some time in hand. I'll give you it back, Mr um, um, Finlay. Thanks very much. I wonder uh, Mr Whiteman uh, could give us some indication of the numbers of people who come to him, uh, surgeries, email, whatever, um, who talk about the reductions in cuts to local government. Is that quite a significant part of his mailbag? Mr Whiteman. Um, Mr Finlay for that intervention. Uh, yes, people do come to me talking about the pressures that local government uh, face and the cuts that are taking place across the country. And I agree, it is in a bad place. And part of the reason for that is because we have had a decade uh, of a government uh, insisting on telling local government how much it can raise in tax. And we want to turn that whole thing around, which is why in budget negotiations this year, hopefully we've started a process of revitalizing local government and giving it greater fiscal freedom, but it'll, it'll take a long, long uh, time. Um, so to conclude, uh, presiding uh, officer, uh, we agree that this is a useful starting point, but if we're to truly embolden local democracy, we must evolve decision-making and budgets to a much more local level. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, open debate, four minute speeches. I call James Dornan, followed by Gordon Winters. Mr Dornan, please. Thank you, President Officer. It's a pleasure to speak in today's debate, which I'm sure from the contributions we've heard so far will be a fairly positive one. As every member will agree, Scotland's communities are a rich source of energy, creativity and talent. Each of our communities are made up of people from diverse backgrounds with different skills and experiences, and all of whom have something to contribute to improving Scotland's physically, socially, and economically. And working together can only help to create the real world experience that Mr. Finlay spoke of earlier. As convener of the Local Government and Communities Committee, and through my own constituency casework, I know people in communities can often feel they are sidelined when it comes to making or contributing to local decisions. But in my opinion, it's the people who live and work in a community who know what's best for that community and they are key to improving local places when they're involved in local decision making and delivery. Indeed, it's why the Scottish Government has implemented a number of community empowerment policies, whether it's through the Community Empowerment Act, the Community Choices Programme, or work in encouraging councils to use participatory budgets. There is a recognition from the Scottish Government that people should play their full part in their local area and shape their own futures. Signing officer, central and local government have a huge role to play and to encourage communities to work together. It is through collaboration and partnership that we will realise Scotland's full potential and improve outcomes and addresses the inequalities in and across our communities. 
Fundamentally, the place principle provides a collective focus to support inclusive economic growth and create places which are both successful and sustainable. And as the principle lays out, places are where people, location and resources can combine to create a sense of identity and purpose at the heart of addressing the needs and realising the full potential of communities. As part of this, Place Principle calls on all those responsible for providing services and looking after assets in a place to work and plan together and with local communities to improve the lives of people, support inclusive growth and create more successful places. Research has shown that when people and communities feel empowered, there is great, greater participation in local democracy, increased confidence and skills among local people, more people volunteering in their communities and greater satisfaction with quality of life in their neighbourhood. There can be no doubt many challenges which affect disadvantaged communities are deep rooted and can be better solved collaboratively rather than by individual partners working in isolation or the, 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 it being a top down approach where the community are told this is what's going to happen to your local area and them not having the appropriate buy in at the appropriate time. Officer, I'd like to give an example of a community-led organisation in my constituency who are undertaking great work but sometimes feel powerless when it comes to local decision making. Pollock Shaw's Community Hub recently held a community consultation on the future of the local Pollock Shaw's shopping arcade. This arcade, which is due for demolition, is at the heart of the community-led push for local regeneration. The hub held two open days looking at designs for a new shopping centre and also a selection of public realm examples from across the UK and beyond. The process was started by community activists who feel that local authority, other agencies and the private sector can take singular decisions about their community, sometimes with little or no consultation with the community itself. There is of course great work being done by Glasgow City Council to include local groups like the Hub, who have themselves have actually been recipients of funding through participatory budgeting. However, through the place principle and by providing a shared understanding of the place, even better collaboration and community involvement is encouraged, which can overcome organisational or sectoral boundaries. Place-based approaches can provide a better way of enabling local communities to influence, shape and deliver long-term solutions, which would benefit the communities in Pollock Shaws and across Scotland. A holistic approach, as offered by the Place Principle, is increasingly recognised as best way to consider issues of local economy, physical infrastructure and the social aspects of place. And summing up, presiding officer, the place principle provides a coherent focus for many differing agendas. And I'd encourage all public bodies to follow the Scottish Government and COSLA's lead and adopt a policy to bring the many ideas about services, investments, resources and assets together under one roof to help shape a better place. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call Gordon Lindhurst to be followed by Bob Doris. Gordon Lindhurst. Presiding officer, I too welcome the opportunity to speak in today's debate. Our happiness and well-being depend to a great extent on the place in which we live. We should have places where we belong, feel safe, and where the physical elements of a place should cater to our needs. The importance of a place, after all, is not just relevant in terms of its physical layout, or amenities, but in the very fact that it is where people live, socialize, and meet others. And in developing places that are fit for all, it is the local authorities providing the services and looking after local assets that should be leading the way with the principles of localism and empowering communities at the forefront of their minds. And this from our biggest cities to our smallest towns and villages. Here in Edinburgh, we heard more last week about a 10-year plan for the city, including further tram routes, replacing in part some bus services, as well as plans for pedestrian areas and even building lifts linking different parts of the city. Although in their early stages, these plans will no doubt generate their fair share of debate given previous debacles in the city concerning public services. But it is an ideal opportunity to test that place principle, including a public consultation process that actually has a far and deep reach into the heart of our communities. Because too often, consultation scratches the surface, paying lip service to the need to ask people what they think without actually taking it on board or producing results that are reflective of the wider population. A lesson, I'm sure, for this parliament as much as for local authorities. 
So I hope that Edinburgh City Council will make that effort before embarking on such ambitious plans. Presiding officer, it is not just places that change over time, but also people. Let me reflect on the fact that people's needs change too, and the views and needs of those people should continue to be represented. It has struck me in preparing for this debate that there are various groups, many of whom we as MSPs will have met with, who represent specific needs or specific groups of people in our communities. I myself am pleased to have worked with dementia-friendly Pentlands in Edinburgh, a group of people who volunteer in communities in the southwest of Edinburgh. To me, they re resemble the spirit of the place principle, as their goal is to give people living with dementia a stronger presence locally by building communities that are safe, supportive, strong, and resilient enough to support dementia sufferers and their carers. And not only do they help people feel more included through initiatives such as the PAM Cafe in Balerno, they also run a project called Community Conversations, where those with dementia and the people that look after them are asked what they think their communities can do to become more dementia friendly. Having gathered these views, they disseminate them to the local community. For example, by educating people through the dementia-friendly business scheme, carrying out environmental and signage audits within the Pentlands area, and feeding into community transport consultation processes. That, to me, resembles exactly what the PLACE principle is all about, a joined-up collaborative approach to services that takes into account everyone's needs, including those of dementia sufferers. Let me finish, therefore, by paying tribute to all the volunteers who work as part of dementia-friendly Pentlands and thank them for the work that they do. Thank you very much. And I call Bob Doris to be followed by Neil Findlay. Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, President Officer. And I want to use this to be on adoption of the place principle mm -hmm. to highlight some excellent work taking place, mm -hmm. uh, which is community-led and is in my constituency. Uh, it's been a privilege to seek to support some of these efforts in the communities that I, I represent. And as I've done before in this chamber, let me praise the work of the Royston Strategy Group. I was pleased to hold a member's debate on the subject of Royston regeneration way back on the 24th of June 2014, so some time ago. That debate praised the community-led nature of the anticipated regeneration being championed by the strategy group, driven through local housing associations, and the local Rosemount Development Trust. A major community consultation followed and partnership with Kevin Murray Associates led to a vision document for the local community. Whilst many, uh, whilst many community asks still need to, progress, need to be progressed and delivered, presiding officer, there has been successes. And I think in the context of this debate, it's important to put some of those on the record. So Royston Hill will now have a new community hub £1 million coming from the Big Lottery Fund and £575,000 coming from the Scottish Government's Capital Regeneration Fund. The community will take back control of derelict land known as the Triangle Site as Copperworks Housing Association get £419,000 from the Scottish Land Fund. These were key asks following a place-based community-led consultation and they have been delivered. Significantly, the local authority had no regeneration plans for Royston. So the community got on and designed their own and now they're delivering. Surely that's a place-based success that is actually community-led and that shows what can be achieved. But it's important, President Officer, if you offer a voice and you offer hope, then you have to offer the prospect of delivery. And we shouldn't give false hope. So that's why I want to put a concrete example of where success can be achieved. Uh, that's also why, in partnership with Springburn Community Council, we have established the Springburn Regeneration Forum. We did that in March 2017. And can I pay tribute to the Community Council and Helen Carroll in particular for their sheer energy to improve the local area. Again, the area didn't have a regeneration plan from the local authority, although there are sizable regeneration plans surrounding it, such as at Red Road and at Cowlairs, but actually the town centre itself, no real attempts to regenerate it. But fast forward to today. The Regeneration Forum has secured around £40,000 to open a, a new community hub in the shopping centre, 
or on a variety of projects and to work with Kevin Murray Associates once more to run a two-day charrettes as part of a massive, a, a massive community consultation to develop Springburn's community-led vision. And I want to thank the Scottish Government who put over £20,000 uh, in, into the pot of cash to make that happen. NG Homes that put £10,000 in to Glasgow City Council who also put £10,000 in and to several others who gave money, but also to the shopping centre and the Winter Gardens Trust and others who actually gave support in kind. On the 28th of May uh, this year, this month, uh, we will feed back our findings of the charrettes to the wider community. We expect to create expectations when our vision is fleshed out, but that puts a challenge on all of us, on the local authority, on the Scottish Government and other funding partners to find a way of delivering that vision. And I'm sure we can. That's why I note, for example, the £50 million town centre regeneration fund might be crucial in attracting much, much of that investment uh, to the local place in, in Springburn. The, the, the place principle is vital if we're going to deliver a strategic community-led view of what our town centres and our communities look like. I've seen it happen in Royston in my constituency. I see it emerging in Springburn in my constituency and we all have a key role as MSPs, as local delivery agents, not to lead the regeneration, but to build capacity within our communities to let them lead the regeneration. But we have to deliver for those communities. Thank you very much. I call Neil Findlay to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Neil Findlay. Thanks, President Officer. I'm sure uh, many of us love the places we live in and we are connected to them and the people who live around us and communities uh, across Scotland have often been fashioned around uh, workplaces, many that have long gone, whether that be mills or mines or steelworks or the fishing or farming industries. Um, they shape the landscape, the infrastructure, the culture, and most notably and importantly, the people. And to the west and east of my region, the earth provided coal and things like shale and clay and stone, um, hard graft and many lost shortened lives shaped the people and still does and we had we have or have had uh, infrastructure like miners welfare clubs working men's institutes libraries and, and football pitches dog tracks pigeon ducats women's guilds the cooperative traditional housing miners rows and the like and these were features in many of these communities but while some of them have gone what hasn't hasn't gone is the sense of community and the pride of being from that town or village. I love the place I live. I love the communities I work in and I socialise in. The people, the, the individual culture of each of the villages and the idiosyncrasies of each of them. But uh, I and all of us here are in the very fortunate position that we can afford to choose where we live and set up our home uh, or have our family or indeed retire to. But many people aren't able to do that. In a market system, choice is often available only to those who have income that allows them to exercise that choice. Many have to make do with what they can find. If they're lucky, they may be allocated a, a home by a council or a housing association, or they can afford a private rent. Others have to share a house or a flat. Too many live a transient life, moving from town to town or area to area just to keep a roof over their head. Some live their lives on the streets in hostels or in tents of cardboard or canvas. For people in these circumstances, Parliamentary debates are in place in the design of services or the urban realm and theoret theoretical discussions about concepts of empowerment are light years away from anything that they are experiencing on a day-to-day -day basis. Sometimes in this place I think I live in a parallel universe and I know some people might agree and think I do as well. But this is definitely one of those days because people out there are not stroking their chins or reading books about planning concepts and trends. Many are wondering where they'll sleep tonight, whether they have enough money for a hostel, how they will feed themselves, what medical support they can get for mental ill health or addiction. And of course, I accept that quality uh, design of places, the places we live, has a huge impact on the well-being of people in our communities. If we have clean, tidy streets, welcoming parks, high streets with bustling shops, houses built to last that are warm and affordable, and local services that are adequately staffed, and doctor surgeries with appointments, then that is what we all want to see. But for so many people, that is not the reality. And of course, good design can 
uh, create a welcoming, supportive environment, impacting on well-being and community cohesion. This is not new. This is not rocket science. But it cannot be done, I say to ministers, and I say to government backbenchers on a wing and a prayer against a background of year on year on year on year cuts, brutal cuts, 100 million from my council alone in West Lothian. That's why I say we live in a parallel universe. We've seen in recent months reports of health inequality rising and life expectancy fallen. Look on the streets of this city, yards from this parliament, and you'll see homelessness increasing and drug deaths at record levels. This is the harsh, cold reality of life in our towns and cities today. And we'll need more than principles that service, service providers can opt out of to tackle it. So I ask the government, when we're talking about all of this nice stuff, can we address the hard facts of what people in our communities are experiencing? Because if not, they will look on this place as a complete irrelevance to their lives. Thank you very much. I call Stuart McMillan to be followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you very much, President Officer. President Officer, I actually do welcome this debate and the dialogue regarding the place principle. And certainly listening to some colleagues in the chamber, you'd think that life was perfect pre uh, the, the SNP government coming to power in 2007. And life certainly wasn't perfect for many, many people. Life certainly wasn't perfect, Mr Finlay, for many, many people in my community, as well as the community that you represent as well. Now, the collective focus to support inclusive economic growth, uh, to create places which are both successful and sustainable, isn't just a well-intentioned target, but it's actually a common sense approach. Now, as we have heard already from some colleagues uh, today, uh, this collaborative approach uh, to designing the principle is welcome, but it should have happened many, many years ago. Now, thankfully, the silo mentality of working uh, in, in some aspects of the public sector started to change some years ago, uh, and this has certainly moved forward since 2007. Now, we've had today in, in this chamber, we've had a statement from Rosanna Cunningham, our Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, uh, once again highlighting the issue of the climate emergency that we face. And the Cabinet Secretary spoke earlier on regarding the, the Scottish Government, all the Cabinet Secretaries and the Ministers, to be looking at all the current activities to examine what we need to do to actually help our climate. Now, President Officer, whether it's climate change, whether it's health and social care partnerships, or whether it's the place principle, it's work that can only improve our country and also the opportunities for our population. Now, President Officer, the, the various funds that are available, such as the Town Centre Fund, the Regeneration Capital Grant Fund, the Vacant and Derrick Land Fund, Investing in Communities Fund, and also Spruce, are important in trying to bring about successful and sustainable places. Now, I'm saying also, I, I chaired the cross-party group on visual impairment, and uh, a number of years ago, uh, I was offered uh, the chance by Guide Dog Scotland uh, to undertake a walk blindfolded with a guide dog. Now, it happened in Greenwich uh, along uh, Kirkart Street, from Clay Square to Kirkart Street. Now, it was uh, an emotional and uh, challenging activity to do, but it also ensured that I became more aware of the built-up environment in my community. Now, after the event, uh, when speaking to a, a local reporter, I was asked uh, if I now wanted the, the local authority to actually demolish and build a better and more, success, a more accessible environment. Now, clearly, that would not have been realistic. What is realistic, though, is that future investments are done collaboratively, and also with accessibility in mind to consider every single member of our society. There's also another element, and that was the issue of any kind of retrofitting, any improvements that actually could be made to the existing uh, infrastructure that we have in our towns uh, and cities and also in our rural communities. Because let's face it, I mean, the length and breadth of Scotland, there are many carbuncles have actually been, have actually been built over the years. So, I mean, planning, certainly in the past, clearly wasn't perfect. Some of these things actually were put up in our, in our communities. In, in my community, in my constituency, uh, there are many organisations who, who already do operate uh, with that, uh, that sense of engagement and that sense of place principle. Uh, I think there's quite a number of I mean, Your Voice and Inverclyde Carers Centre are hugely important in actually getting that message over to the, the elected politicians. I can also think of another, another three examples. The Belleville Community Garden in East End of Greenock, the Inverclyde Community Hub, uh, so the Inverkip Community Hub, 
uh, and also the Denver Clare Association of Mental Health. They've got the Broomhill Gardens and Community Hub. Uh, these are three projects that were led by, uh, by the communities themselves uh, and actually fashioned that change and also fashioned uh, the politicians to get involved and make sure change, positive change actually happened in these communities. Uh, presenting also, there is still a journey to go, but I, I do welcome the place principle. And certainly I do welcome the sense of empowerment it will provide to our communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Willie Coffey. Jeremy Balfour. Uh, thank you, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, I think uh, there is at least agreement that we all agree that the place principle is something that is good in principle, uh, but probably still needs more work in practice. Um, as a former councillor uh, here in Edinburgh, I was very, very aware of often the silos that did exist between different public bodies and actually within public bodies themselves. I have to say, I'm slightly less uh, optimistic than Stuart McMillan was that these barriers have broken down and are being broken down. And I do actually think there's still a lot of work to be done, particularly within local authorities, to make sure that different uh, departments are speaking to each other and also speaking to um, other local authority organisations and bodies. Certainly. Jim McMillan. I thank Mr. Baffer for taking the intervention. I think uh, he will, uh, if he looks back on the record, I did say that there's still a journey to be undertaken, but I do welcome the progress that actually has been made. Jeremy Balfour. No, I just think it's a difference between me being a pessimist and you being an optimist, and I fully uh, <laughs> relate to what you said. <laughs> oh. um, however, um, I do think there is um, something that we all have to look at, both within uh, Scottish Government um, and within local authorities, and that is the role of the third sector. I, and I've been pleased uh, this afternoon that a number of members from um, across the parties have mentioned uh, local projects within their local areas. Because if we are going to have this place principle, it can't simply be uh, health boards, uh, local authorities, other large organisations. But the third sector has a vital role to play, because often they are the ones that know what is going on within that local community and know what services need to be provided. And um, I do get concerned still, uh, both within um, Edinburgh City Council, but within other local authorities as well, that it is often the easy budget to cut. Where, where cuts have to be made, often the third sector budgets are gone after. And I think that is short term, uh, it's maybe easy to justify, but the long term effect on communities uh, will be devastating. I think perhaps the largest place principle that we have seen um, across Scotland is the Joint Integrated Board, how we try to bring health and social care together. And, and I think all of us uh, supported that and still support that principle because it is breaking down silos. But I was interested in the Cabinet Secretary's uh, opening remarks that she said, where this happens, it needs to be democratic accountable and transparent. And I think those are principles we all agree upon in regard to any service that is provided. And I do have some concerns, uh, presiding officer, around the democratic, transparent, transparent and accountability of some of these joint boards. And um, I think uh, we all want to see better services. But some of the decisions made recently, again, here in Malovians, um, where we have seen uh, groups who have been funded, uh, perhaps for a long time, had the funding completely cut without much notice, is, a way, is not the way forward. So in conclusion, uh, President Officer, I do welcome this debate, and I welcome the way that things are moving, but I do think we have to keep in mind, are the organisations that we are looking at accountable and democratic, and are they transparent to the people who are lo living locally and need those services? Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And I call Willie Coffey to be followed by Angela Constance. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much. <coughs> Presiding officer, there is uh, good news on this from East Ayrshire, at least, that I hope might bring a, a smile, perhaps, to the faces of some of the gloomsters in the chamber this afternoon. Um, when I read over the, the briefing notes for the debate, my first reaction was, at long last, well done. Good to put people in places at the centre of everything we do. The place principle approach is easy to understand, easy to compile, 
and can actually be quite rewarding for those who use it. At first sight, it might appear to be just one of those new initiatives that appear and then gently slip off the radar. But I think it will become a really important tool to help our communities set out their vision for their place in our community. As usual, presiding officer, I'm indebted to my colleagues in East Ayrshire, who once again stepped up to the mark to provide me with a really helpful insight into the trailblazing work already carried out there in support of the place principle, or place making as it's referred to down there. Councillor Elena Whittam, my friend and colleague, is COSLA's spokesperson in community wellbeing and also serves as the deputy council leader. From what I've been told by Councillor Whittam and others, East Ayrshire is the first council in Scotland to include placemaking led by and for the community. As far back as 2016, East Ayrshire Council changed how their planning and economic development teams worked to incorporate place -based, this place-based approach. Their placemaking model lets people in the community take control of their priorities for the improvement to the places where they live. And it's essentially at the heart of the principle that the government has outlined today. This involved the council and community steering groups working together to produce a, a map of the community, identifying areas that need improvement and how these improvements might be made. We believe the first of these in Scotland was in East Ayrshire and the Irvine Valley town of New Mills, to be specific. It's also been going on in Ochil Tree and Catherine and neighbouring communities and another 28 locations are in progress throughout East Ayrshire. The steering group was the New Mills Regeneration Association. They undertook the essential community engagement, workshops and public consultations to produce the placemaking maps and action plans for New Mills and Greenholm. The resultant New Mills action map and placemaking programme identified their priorities for New Mills, which was fed into the development of East Ayrshire Council's community-led action plans. The New Mills placemaking plan was approved by our council in 2018 and it has since been adopted by the council as a statutory supplementary guidance. Now, why is that important? Because once adopted, this plan has now become part of the local planning policy and that's the key. All the good work done by local people is now very much enshrined an enshrined part of the local planning process. It's a long way from the planning process. I remember presiding officer, when officials, God bless them, presented a community master plan to local people after it had been pretty much devised almost exclusively by officials. This place principle approach now gives the local community's vision the appropriate status and influence, and it must be taken into account and into consideration by private developers and public sector organisations. And why not? I've seen the work carried out in New Mills, and it's really great to see the town from this perspective setting out a vision for creating more civic space, cycle and walking areas, buildings to, pre to be protected and developed, new housing spaces, places with business potential and improving the streetscapes and environmental improvements. All of these provide us with a, a more holistic view of how our communities see their future and how it wants its towns and villages to develop. So well done, New Mills. That's the reality, at least in East Ayrshire. And I would commend this approach to members to persuade their councils to embrace it elsewhere. Um, indeed, East Ayrshire has already allocated £1.7 million from its town centre fund using community-led regeneration as the driver. So it is actually working. It's not theoretical and pie in the sky, as some members are, are suggesting that it is. Just to end, presiding officer, I'm looking forward to placemaking being progressed right across Kilmarnock in the Irvine Valley, Ayrshire and indeed Scotland. It really does work because local people feel they have the influence in shaping the future of their communities. And lastly, I would encourage uh, members to come and see this work and to welcome members to perhaps visit New Mills this year and take part in the local food and arts and craft festivals on September 21st and 22nd, where you'll be made most welcome. Thank you. Thank you, and I call Angela Constance before we move to the first of our closing speeches. Angela Constance. Thank you, presiding officer. Uh, in advance of today's debate, I took the time to read the Scottish Government's three-page fact sheet uh, explaining the place principle. But of course, the nub of it is that at the end of the day, folk want to shape their own lives. They want to change their own lives for the better. 
and we all need to find ways to ditch the silos that exist uh, within and across services. And of course the real test will be how we are actually putting all this into practice, how we demonstrate the place principle, as others have said, in the real world. And to be able to point to more than anecdotal or isolated examples or project, and we need to move from the exceptional uh, to the normal. Um, and therefore, I, like others, I uh, think it is important that the Scottish Government keep Parliament informed uh, of progress. Good to see ministers uh, leading uh, a debate today. Uh, but there is a role for others. There are opportunities for local government and other partners in the public sector to show leadership too, because we need to recognise that when it comes to empowering communities, that this isn't some two-dimensional approach. Um, it's not uh, a top-down process. And we also have to accept uh, that if we are really listening to communities, uh, it won't always be comfortable uh, and they will indeed uh, challenge orthodoxy. And I believe that the Local Governance Review is particularly uh, important in this regard. And I wonder if the Minister, when she's summing up, can perhaps uh, update uh, of its progress. Because the Local Governance Review uh, is important to establish what the next steps are uh, for meaningful uh, community empowerment. Others, presiding officer, have alluded to the need to harness and make best use of our resources. Uh, due to uh, austerity uh, and as a result of austerity there's part of this debate that feels like uh, necessity but uh, good public sector reform and community empowering has to be far more than a cost cutting exercise in fact it shouldn't be about cutting corners uh, we have to recognize that it is the right thing to do and it's the smart thing to do in terms of uh, sustainable public services about mainstreaming that asset-based uh, approach uh, that's been championed uh, by Harry Burns because it's good for people's psychological uh, and physical health. And it's also uh, the gateway to uh, really establishing uh, good preventative services on the basis of what actually works uh, for communities. And I know this week we have uh, spent much time uh, celebrating the past 20 years uh, of this parliament and there is indeed uh, much uh, to, 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 to celebrate. Um, but if I had to point to uh, one negative, uh, it would be that that public sector reform journey uh, should have been started uh, far, far um, earlier. I do want to mention, President Officer, that the Child Poverty Delivery Plan, Every Child, Every Chance, um, as well as a central focus on earnings, cost of living, uh, social security policy, it also recognises the importance of place-based approach uh, to improving the quality of life, actions to prevent young people who are today growing up in poverty uh, from becoming parents who in turn have to bring up their own children in, in poverty. And I know that uh, within the Child Poverty Development Plan, there was a commitment to invest £2 million uh, in the Innovative Children's Neighbourhood Scotland uh, programme, the first being in Bridgeton and Dilmarnock. Um, and there was uh, ambitions to extend that uh, to other areas. And I'd be grateful again if the Minister has time, if she could uh, update us um, about, about that uh, approach uh, as well also. In terms of my own constituency, uh, presiding officer, I see uh, many local community organisations, Fault House and Breek Valley Community Development Trust, uh, there's West Cauldron Harbour Community Development Trust who have a fantastic vision for the old uh, cooperative uh, bakery building uh, in West Calder. I see social enterprises such as Kids Eco uh, and the School Uniform uh, Bank in West Lothian as well that are all responding to very harsh and real uh, community needs. But it is these uh, organisations uh, that, in my mind, are very much the, the, the successor uh, to the, the cooperative uh, movement that has a, a very proud history uh, in West Lothian. And uh, my final point, presiding officer, is for, for many years before I entered this place, um, I was a, a frontline social worker, and I will never demure from the importance of investment in public services. But I also, uh, over my career, uh, recognise that how services are delivered and by whom uh, is important in addition to how much we invest. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Let me move now to closing speeches. Alex Rowley to be followed by Graeme Simpson. Okay, thank you, President Officer. There is, there is a sense in which, you know, I certainly have made clear that there is nothing in the motion from the government today that you could disagree with. But there is a sense sometimes in this place, certainly I feel, it's a bit like the Hans Christian Andersen Emperor's new clothing, where, where if anybody speaks out, everybody's in complete denial. Now, there is no question that the years of austerity have impacted on communities up and down Scotland. And, and anybody that, that, that says that's not the case is in complete denial. If you take, for example, the importance of play uh, and, and the importance of play parts, they're disappearing. Yet I know my own granddaughter, her mum tells me, spent the weekend with her pals playing in a play park. Yet they're disappearing. The simple things that are in communities like play parks, councils say they can't maintain them anymore. So the impact at a very practical level, I was out campaigning, presiding officer in Cowdenbeath, on, on Friday, and a lady from Quarry Court came up and spoke to me about the parking issues in Quarry Court and Blackburn Drive in Cowdenbeath. And she told me she had to be home by lunchtime because she has a, a space that's marked off because of, because of her car and, and her mobility. But if she's not in by the afternoon, she can't get parked. Now, that community has been crying out for year on year on year about, about the fact that, that they need car parking. Within a community planning model where you had local people actually setting out what their local priorities were in a community plan, then that would work. Because those people clearly in that area would say there's our priority and they then influence the decisions and the spend. So, so, but the problem is, if, if the council then turn around and say, well, we've had to slash these budgets, we actually haven't got any money to put parking places in, then that disrupts people's lives. Uh, Angela Constance acknowledged, acknowledged austerity as being a key issue. Willie Coffey. Thanks very much to Alec for taking the intervention. In intervention. President Officer, I would just invite Alec and his colleagues to come down to East Ayrshire and see this process actually working in practice, you'd be very welcome to come and see it. Actually. The uh, convener as a uh, presiding officer as a, as a councillor and former council leader, community planning is not only something that I have supported in principle, I've actually driven the idea of community planning. And, and, and if you come to Dunfermline, you'll find one of the best local community planning partnerships in, in the country. Uh, and there, one of their successes is because it's not driven by council officials, it's driven by local people with council officials being there to be able to support. Uh, but again, again, they have done, a, a, I think it was Willie Coffey, it was Bob Doris talked about a charrette. They have done a charrette and, and, and there I met with them just, just a few weeks ago. Their issue now is how did they get the money to implement that? Part of that, quite interestingly, would be the town centre monies, which has been welcomed, and the four point odd million pound to be spent in five. But I would say to the Cabinet Secretary, how are local people and local communities actually going to have a say on how that money is distributed? Or is it just going to be a group of council officers, uh, officials, and councillors making those decisions? Bob, Bob Joris. I agree with the member that austerity is an issue. We've got different political solutions in relation to that, but I agree with you in relation to that. But there is really good practice across the country that's community-led that actually existed way before community planning partners were doing their stuff about local place. Would you not welcome the fact that this has been shared right across the country and it can improve communities, make sure the money we do have is spent wisely and is community-led? I don't think there's, there's, there's any disagreement, and I don't understand why why so many SNP members seem to take an offence at uh, uh, us highlighting the impact of austerity. Nobody, Stuart McMillan was quite wrong to say that, that any of us had suggested this, this was down to the SNP government. I'm very clear where austerity comes from. I'm very clear it's a political decision. All I'm saying is the impact of austerity on communities hinders the community planning process. And the community planning process is something that, that I have certainly uh, supported 
And Jerry Bel Jeremy Belfer spoke about, about councils and, and, and the, what I used to call departmentalism within councils. And you're right, you're, Mr. Balfour's right. It does exist, continues to exist. Indeed, if you look at the Scottish Government, I think you'll find whether it's silos or departmentalism, it will run through government departments. Uh, it's not something that's been, been, been uh, wiped out. It's certainly been, been tackled. Uh, and that, that's important. But how you actually involve communities. And Campbell Christie, in his report, he, what he highlighted was that too many public authorities were coming to the table at the point where there was crisis, firefighting, if you like, and we needed to see more investment in preventative work. But when you see youth clubs shutting down, when you see community and development, CLD, community and learning development, workers, youth workers being paid off at a rate that are not being replaced, then where's the preventative work with the young people? Where's the preventative work in our communities? Uh, somebody mentioned about, about a day centre for older people. Can Ross Day Centre, I've mentioned many times, where they're providing lunch clubs That's and providing time, exercise for older people. So, Lots of good things happening out there, lots of project-based work happening, but when they run out of money, that work stops. Let's be truthful and acknowledge what is happening in our communities, and then once we acknowledge the problem, we can hopefully start to address it. Thank you. And I call Graham Simpson to be followed by the Cabinet Secretary. <clears throat> Officer, um, I think this has been uh, an interesting debate uh, in parts. Uh, and it's certainly helped me no end. Uh, I'm known for my brevity. I like plain English, and I don't like government speak. The place principle could easily fall into that category, and I initially couldn't make head nor tail of it. But I've got there, I think. The place principle is that bodies working in a particular area, let's say, presiding officer, the great place that is East Kilbride, should work together. Now, that makes sense, doesn't it? Well, that's my take on it anyway, but let's see what the government says. According to them, the place principle says we recognize that place is where people, location, and resources combine to create a sense of identity and purpose and is at the heart of addressing the needs and realizing the full potential of communities. Places are shaped by the way resources, services, and assets are directed and used by the people who live and invest in them. The place pr principle requests that all those responsible for providing services and looking after assets in a place need to work and plan together and with local communities to improve the lives of people, support inclusive and sustainable growth, and create more successful places. I hope you can just about follow that, presiding officer. It all sounds very sensible. It was signed by the Scottish Government and COSLA, now, it's all very well if everyone goes along with the idea that public authorities should work together, but people can and do work in silos, as we've heard, uh, and sometimes it's difficult to get them to change. It's worth trying, though, and that's why I do like the fact that this principle was drawn up. Some tools have been developed to help people along the way. One is the PLACE standard tool, and I want to talk a bit about that. It's particularly relevant because we'll soon be dealing with the planning bill in this chamber where community engagement will feature heavily. The tool is there to help anyone assess and improve the quality uh, of a place. And to use it, you're asked 14 questions uh, and asked to give ratings. And these are, can you easily walk and cycle around using good quality routes? Does public transport meet your needs? Do traffic and parking arrangements allow people to move around safely? Do buildings, streets, and public spaces create an attractive place that's easy to get around? Can you regularly experience good quality natural space? Can you access a range of space with opportunities for play and recreation? Do facilities and amenities meet your needs? Is there an active local economy and the opportunity to access good quality work. Uh, there are a number of other questions. I won't go, go through them all, but you should be able to see what the priorities are for change 
an improvement once you've been through this process. So it could be obvious that you need more and better green spaces, that your housing is run down, that there are not enough play facilities. Now you could be very cynical about this kind of stuff, but it's basically about working with people to improve their communities. And done well, done with people, it works well. A really good example is what's next for Stromness. And that's a series of meetings later this week where Orkney Islanders will be asked how they would like their community to develop in the next five or ten years. That's, that's great. And Aileen Campbell uh, mentioned projects in Fort William and Grand Town. Uh, Willie Coffey uh, made reference to some of the great work going on uh, in Ayrshire. And if the invitation is still open from Willie Coffey, I, I would uh, love to visit East Ayrshire if he will host the visit. Now, where it doesn't work is if it's used to just pay lip service to community involvement uh, or where you exclude certain groups. And I thought the submission that we had from Inclusion Scotland ahead of this debate was particularly powerful in expressing the view that disabled people are often left out. There's been some excellent contributions today. I just want to mention a, a few of them. Uh, Gordon Lindhurst uh, mentioned the uh, dem dementia-friendly project in Pentlands. Uh, Yes, I will. Neil Findlay. I'm certainly pleased that he's mentioned uh, disabled people being uh, missing out on some of this agenda, but I wonder if he would reflect on his own party's treatment of disabled people in recent years, which has seen them excluded from many things, including having dignity and a decent income. Graeme Simpson. I think Neil Finlay's uh, contribution um, just says it all about Labour today. It's been a doom-laden uh, Labour Party that's turned up to this debate um, and this should have been a consensual and positive debate highlighting uh, many local projects uh, which uh, ma many of the other members have tried to do. Um, so Michelle Ballantyne mentioned uh, the importance of great architecture, Andy Whiteman talk about, talked about centralised Scotland, uh, James Dornan didn't rant so that was good. <laughs> And, uh, and, he, and he, he spoke about the, uh, the excellent uh, Pollock Shores hub. Bob Doris also spoke about uh, local projects uh, and Jeremy Balfour um, uh, expressed his frustrations uh, with uh, local government and third sector cuts. But um, basically, I, I thought uh, across the piece, uh, members were very positive in highlighting some of the great work going on in their areas. I tabled an amendment, uh, presiding officer, uh, which was uh, not accepted uh, by yourself, uh, making me feel a bit like a Lib Dem. Um, it certainly, uh, it si sim simply um, urged the government to keep us informed of how the place principle is progressing. So I'll just have to informally uh, request that. It was positive and consensual, uh, unlike Labour's, and you can see the, 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 the complete lack of interest uh, on the Labour benches uh, to this debate, uh, un unlike uh, the rest of the chamber. Uh, I tabled it because we need to keep tabs on how effective this principle is in practice. There is, after all, no point in developing these things if people don't use them. That would just give ammunition to people who might say, this is government waffle, and we wouldn't want that. <laughs> Thank you, Anna. Call on the Cabinet Secretary, Eileen Campbell. Thank you, President Officer. Uh, and despite uh, the lack of disagreement over the place principle itself, it has nevertheless been a, a robust but good d debate, and that's as it should be, because this approach is not designed to simply be some esoteric, beard-stroking philosophy that boils down to just motherhood and apple pie, because our communities deserve much more than that and deserve to be empowered and they deserve to be trusted. And this approach is absolutely not designed to gloss over austerity or the daily struggles that those who are vulnerable or who are living in poverty face. Indeed, it is very much at the forefront of our thoughts because if your day-to-day -day struggles involve working out how you're going to make ends meet, then how can you possibly have the space to think about how you might feel some sense of empowerment or think about any notions of a place principle? This is about trying to ensure that we uh, create a, a country and a society that enables everybody to feel the benefit of what we do and the investment that we make. 
Instead, the police principle seeks to make better use of the resources that we have to knock down uh, silos, to disregard organisational boundaries and to ensure we focus in on people, places and outcomes. And this comes on top of the mitigation measures that we as a government have to apply to soften the blows of welfare reforms and acts that will take over £3 billion out of the social security system by 2020-21. So imagine if we did have all those tools and powers to look after our people and pursue our own policies without needing to use resource to mop up another government's mess. And it's on that premise of powers that I want to respond to some of the points that uh, Andy Whiteman uh, raised. This year, as everyone knows, is the 20th anniversary uh, of the Parliament being reconvened and a useful milestone to further reflect on where power uh, and the balance of that power should lie. And while I don't share all of Mr Whiteman's analysis uh, that he spoke about of local government, I do share some of his concerns around how we do more to empower our communities uh, and the current need to transform local democracy. Because we do seek to empower our communities and participatory budgeting, as he mentioned, is uh, one of those ways we do that. But it is just a good start. It's an approach that I see should be built upon. It gives communities the chance to decide on where money should be spent and on what. But it is just simply a start. And we need to see this grow to be less risk averse and to also uh, ensure that the principle by which that uh, applies itself is by trusting our communities. And that's why we also, along with COSLA, committed to the local governance uh, review. And um, in that, we're taking a whole system approach. This means looking across Scotland's public services, not just local government, local governance, and ensuring that measures to empower people in places in different spheres of governance are cohesive and mutually supportive. And for the uh, in response to Angela Com Constance's uh, uh, request for an update, last year over 4,000 people took part in the Democracy Matters conversation about the future of community level decision making. In addition, more than 40 public sector partners submitted proposals for alternative governance arrangements which can improve outcomes and drive inclusive growth uh, in the places that they serve. Uh, and despite that variety of view, people without exception, overwhelmingly wanted to see a transformation in how decision-making arrangements work in Scotland. They do not want to accept the status quo. So people and communities are uh, up for this and we'll need to respond to that level of engagement and I'll certainly ensure that we keep uh, Angela Constance but the whole chamber more generally updated on the progress of that work. And many other members also made some good and positive contributions. As Stuart McMillan acknowledged, the place principle continues our empowering communities agenda. It builds on our regeneration strategy, the Community Empowerment Scotland Act 2015, land reform, the Scottish Land Fund, the planning bill, public sector reform, rural policy and inclusive, inclusive growth policy. The place principle and place-based approaches are also supportive of a wide range of other policy agendas. For example, our public health reform agenda aims to uh, improve the public health through a whole systems approach focused on prevention and early intervention and creating the conditions for well-being in our communities. But nonetheless, and understandably, many members spoke about their own constituencies and the good work that's happening there, enabled by that focus on that sense of place. Willie Coffey mentioned East Ayrshire. I'm really glad he did because there's a huge amount of positive work happening uh, in East Ayrshire and how their approach has enabled better decisions, joined up decisions and decisions that are taken, uh, not doing things to communities, but decisions that are uh, enhanced by working alongside our communities. And for by the examples that Willie Coffey cited, uh, the East Ayrshire has also um, benefited from the place approach through the good work of the Centre Stage project and I saw uh, also another example recently at the Scottish Civic Trust Awards well Bells Bank receiving recognition for the work there which has transformed that former mining community not because the council did stuff to it but because they worked with the community to recognise the potential and the assets of that area and enabled that place, that community, that town to flourish and to be able to become a thriving, thriving place where people are proud to call, say that they come from. Gordon Linters also spoke about dementia-friendly Pentlands and I think this was a useful example in that it brought to this debate the importance of the communities of interest and how we should not, in the, ability, in the pursuit of empowerment, not risk that we empower the already powerful but also be mindful of not disempowering 
others. And I would totally take on board on that respect in regard to the Alec uh, Rowley's example of the women with problems with disability. And again, I think that underlines that we need to be inclusive in how we engage with people uh, in all walks of life and from all areas of interest. Bob Doris also spoke about charrettes in Springburn, that mass engagement again to help provide a vision for their community, given that community a sense of ownership about how they drive that community forward. And in response to Alec Rowley's points, yeah, sorry, yes, yes. Bob Doris. Secretary for raising uh, the charrettes in Springburn, which now gives me the opportunity, of course, to invite the Cabinet Secretary to Springburn to see that community led regeneration underpinned by the place principle for herself. Uh, Cabinet Secretary, could members take, keep the conversations down, please? Cabinet I happily Secretary. take uh, Mr Doris's uh, uh, invitation and, and to visit uh, Springburn. Uh, but also, though, in response to Alec Rowley's points, of course austerity has impacted on our communities, but I think we need to be in this debate clear on where austerity has come from. And I think that's where people have been disappointed with some of the contributions from Labour, because it sometimes felt that it missed that the fundamental uh, owners of austerity are the Westminster government and the Conservative Party. And I think that's where some of the uh, grumbling uh, occurred through the debate and their contributions. Moreover, to respond to Angela Constance around the point she raised around the children's neighbourhood uh, and the progression of new sites, work is underway on that to identify new sites and of course we'll keep her updated on the progress of that. And then there was a particular request from Michelle Ballantyne about us looking to, looking to the Scottish Government to monitor councils and how they implement the place principle, which is quite contradictory to some of the other comments that were made about us wanting or seeking to centralise lots of things and disappearing local government. So we're not planning to monitor councils per se, but what we are wanting to do is work with local authorities, work with councils to make the place principle uh, a reality and something that's tangible. Very briefly, Michelle Barton, the Minister's last minute. OK. Um, my concern was that obviously the place-based um, a place-based approaches report in 2016 identified the UK has had a place-based approach since the 1970s. So my concern is if, if we're having to revitalise it, bring in a new one, what are we going to do to make sure that actually does make a difference? Mm -hmm. And again, I think I articulate that by working in partnership with our uh, colleagues in local authority that will work together to make sure that, that, uh, that we can take that forward and make it tangible and make it real. Uh, because ultimately, everyone, regardless of where they sit in the debate or where their uh, views are on uh, some of the, the fundamental problems with uh, a place, approaching a place principle, we all want to see Scotland, which everyone can see and can play a full part in society with empowered communities to, that are able to shape their individual and collective futures. But the place principle will be the only way that we can make a success of our vision on our national performance framework. It'll be one of the only ways that we can try and make good on knocking down the silos that still exist. Uh, that we can make good on the principles of Christie, that we can progress public sector reform. But it will need us to raise the debate on this, to tackle the vicious inequality that exists in our uh, society. I think it's been a good debate. I've been really appreciative of some of the contributions. Uh, and we'll look forward to continuing those debates to make sure that people can feel that they have the ownership of the places that they call home, those areas that need that support that we will give uh, to make sure that we can see everywhere and every part of the country flourish uh, with the success that they desire. Thank you very much. And that concludes our debate on adopting the place principle. I move to the next item of business, and, uh, which is a committee announcement, and I call Graeme Simpson as convener of the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Thank you, presiding officer, um, for this chance to make a short statement on behalf of the uh, Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee. Um, it's a committee that hides in the shadows somewhat, but we look at every piece of legislation and we thought we'd shout about our work on the current planning bill, specifically our report following stage two. There's been huge interest across the chamber in the bill. 24 members from all parties lodged amendments. And I can tell you that something remarkable happened at stage two, presiding officer. Alex Cole Hamilton got one passed. <laughs> some of those some of those amendments revised delegated powers already in the bill some added entirely new ones over 40 new and revised powers were added to the bill at stage two we had no recommendations to make on many of them and we welcome the Scottish Government's commitment to lodge a number of amendments at stage three to seek to rectify some of the concerns we did have our report nevertheless sets out various matters 
on which we think the government should consider lodging amendments. A new section has been added, has added a requirement in the bill that the use of a property for short-term holiday lets will require planning permission. The definition of providing short-term holiday lets is currently only covered in guidance and the committee has called for this definition to either be on the face of the bill or be specified by regulations subject to the affirmative procedure. Uh, I lodged a fair number of amendments to the bill myself. One of those was to allow what's known as land value capture in newly created master plan consent areas. And I praise the committee lawyer who had to nervously tell me there may be one or two issues with that. And the committee agreed unanimously. There is a new section in the bill which says that before determining an application for planning permission, where the development involves any land on which there is a music venue, the planning authority must consult the Music Venues Trust. And the committee asked the Scottish Government to check with the Music Venues Trust that they are okay with that. Presiding officer, can I thank all the committee members for their work, as well as the committee clerks and lawyers, members who lodged amendments at stage two on the bill will have re received a copy of the report. I do, however, urge all members to read it as we head towards stage three in mid-June, and I commend the report to the Parliament. Thank you very much. And we're going to turn at that uh, point to decision time. The first question this evening is that Amendment 17265.2 in the name of Alex Rowley, who seeks to amend Motion 16265 in the name of Aileen Campbell on adopting the place principle, be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a division. Members may cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 17265.2 in the name of Alex Rowley is yes, 74, no, 30. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question is that motion 17265 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended on adopting the place principle be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not agreed. We'll move to a vote. Members, we cast the votes now. The result of the vote on motion 17265 in the name of Aileen Campbell as amended is yes, 74, no, 30. There were no abstentions and the motion as amended is therefore agreed. And that concludes decision time. We're going to turn shortly to members' business in the name of Jenny Gilruth on Home Start. Glenrothes turns 21. We'll just take a few moments though for members and the minister to change seats. Just a few moments suspension. Well, not suspension, just a few moments wait. <laughs> <laughs> 